Hello and welcome to the Charmed Life Podcast. This podcast is all about magic, metaphysics, mysticism, and the unconditional love of the universe. And I am your host. My name is Trisha Carr. What a magical episode we have for you today on the Charmed Life Podcast. I am welcoming a couple of guests who are actually and literally magicians. I'm very excited to bring this conversation to you and the resources that they will be sharing about how you can expand your magical practice. So welcome to this episode again and officially. I want to invite you to please share this episode if you find it to be uh, beneficial, enlightening, edifying. And of course, um, you know, I really would love to hear from you. If you want to leave a review, that really very much helps. All you have to do is scroll down in your podcast app, leave some stars, leave a few words. Really helps to help us to connect in the realm of spirit and energy and helps others to be able to find this podcast. So there you go. That is my open hearted invitation to you. And I also wanted to, before we get into this episode or the conversation, the conscious conversation that I'm presenting for you, I wanted to remind you that if you are able to join us live, the conversations and also I'm going to be doing other episodes multi-streamed live on YouTube, also Facebook and Twitter and things like that. YouTube's the best place to find it though, so you can find the uh, link to my YouTube channel, but it's pretty easy. It's just youtube.com slash Trisha Carr, T-R-I-C-I-A-C-A-R-R. And you will find us live multi-streaming on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Pacific. And I'm about to add Tuesdays. I just need to get my schedule on board with it. (laughs) And I'm going to be doing some really fun solo shows as well. So uh, beyond that, I actually want to remind you also that there are some really exciting programs that I am offering that are Um, high value, low cost, and also um, available to you right now so you can self-pace as well as join in some live coaching group meetings, Those some bonus meetings that are available. We have Easy Intuition and Meditation, which is your 30-day roadmap to catalyzing and expanding and reinvigorating your meditation practice, your connection to your intuition. It includes lessons on human design, divination, and it's uh, again, has your daily dose of these lessons and tons and tons of meditations, which I produce in my professional studio in Burbank, California. And uh, so I invite you to check that out. And then also the Empowered Empath for those who are highly sensitive and highly empathic, wanting to turn that gift of sensitivity into the superpower of strength and compassion that it is actually designed to be and to be checked out of the experience of absorbing to the point of being a suffering sensitive. It's a path that I'm always on (laughs) finding new dimensions to grow as an empath and as a highly sensitive. So check those out. The links are below. And you know what? I'm going to lead you into this really awesome conversation here in a moment. But I wanted to invite you to stay tuned till after the conversation because I was going to give you a little extra something from a class that I taught recently on the seven spiritual laws of the Kybalian. So I was just going to give you... Uh, give you those laws for you to contemplate on and uh, just give you a little bit of teaching after the conversation. So let's begin to get into this really cool conversation between myself and we have Aaron Osias and Damien Eccles. These are the proprietors, the teachers, the facilitators of the Magnum Opus School of Magic. Damien has been on the podcast, I believe this is his third time. Yes, it should be his third time. And Damien is an author and a ceremonial magician. Some of his books include High Magic, which is a fantastic book to be able to begin to open up the practice of high magic or ceremonial magic. I love to have it on audio and also, uh, you know, to read it either in paperback or on like a Kindle that I, cause I get the dual application and I really love the audio version of it because Damien voices it himself. And that way you can hear how to actually pronounce some of the words in the rituals that are being presented. And that's really great. And then he also has Angels and Archangels, A Magician's Guide. 
So check those out, and they're here to talk to us about the Magnum Opus School of Magic, which has a retreat, and they're also presenting it on this education on Patreon. So all of those links are in the description below. So let's go ahead and get into the conversation with Aaron and Damien. And like I said, I will chat with you on the other side and give you the seven spiritual laws of the Kybalion. Enjoy. Damien and Aaron. Hi. 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 Hello. Good to see you again. And you too. And nice to meet you, Aaron. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you for having us. I would love to hear all about, I haven't heard anything yet. I like to be, I like it to be fresh. Would you like, tell us about wherever you want to start about the Magnum School of Magic and, um, you know, I guess about magic in general, high magic, ceremonial magic, wherever you guys want to start. I want to hear it all. Um. I'll, I guess I'll start uh, just to jump in. What the you know the the reason we chose the name Magnum Opus for the school is because in Latin it means the great work, and essentially that's what the point of magic is. You know, yeah. a lot of times in you know like the modern world, we think of it as being exclusively something that people use to uh, you know manifest something that they're you know some sort of change that they're desiring in themselves or their life or what have you. And yes, that is absolutely part of it, but it's like a, a sort of a side effect. You know, yeah. the main thing we're striving for is completion of the great work. We're striving, you know, we'll never reach perfection in any aspect of ourselves or, or our lives or anything else, but we're supposed to be continually striving to make steps towards perfecting ourselves even more. And magic is one of the tools that we have for, for doing that. So that was why we chose the name Magnum Opus. And, you know, just to, to make it brief, one thing that I always try to explain to people is I, I have never felt like, and well, I mean, it's not even that I've never felt like it's just the way it is. Honestly, I don't have anything to say about magic that hasn't already been said by someone at some point in the past and probably far more eloquently than I could ever, you know, articulate it. But a lot of times when you come across these things, especially the more, you know, archaically written stuff like the original Golden Dawn material or even the Crowley stuff or what have you, it can be so hard to decipher or, you know, make sense of for people who are just coming to this work that some people will, you know, give up and walk away from it. And they're like, this is just too hard. I, I'm not going to do this. I'm going back to whatever I was doing before, whatever it is. So my point, ha my, my mission has never been necessarily to bring anything new to the table because it's like the Bible says, there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new to bring to the table. What we're trying to do in Magnum Opus is take all of this material and break it down in a way that anyone can understand it. We're, we're essentially trying to give it to people in the ways that we wish that we would have had it when we were first starting out and, mm -hmm. and hopefully saving a lot of time for people. It's like you're shortening the path of the initiate is what it seems like. Trying to shorten it, but also walking the line of also trying not to water it down. You know, of course we don't not. Wanna, yeah. 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 We don't want to strip anything out of it. We just want right. to make it more accessible or palatable. Right. It can't be watered down. I mean, because the, the interesting thing about the path of the, the initiate to the master or the high priest or priestess is that it has to be a, an authentic, genuine transformation. And, yes. Yes. But and we there don't are also. No there's right. There's no shortcuts, but there can be, you know, just removing some of the unnecessary obstacles. Maybe that's the way to think about it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, when we started doing this on, you know, I knew from the beginning that this was something that I could not do alone. And Aaron, you know, I, this is one of those things, like he has been an incredibly important part of my life for several years. You know, mm -hmm. most of the time when we come across an important event or an important place or an important person in our lives, a lot of times we don't realize it until hindsight. You know, it's very rarely that we come across something or someone and we know immediately, like, this is important. And Aaron was one of those people in my life. You know, I've only ever experienced that thing a very, very small handful of times. But from the moment we met, I knew that he was important 
uh, to my own development. It was like every single time we met, every single time we connected, uh, it was never just for like chit chat or pointless conversation. Like every single time that we would get together, I would walk away from, from meeting with my life headed in a new trajectory. It was almost like he would fill in spots or blanks, or he would say something in our conversations that would, you know, point me in the direction that I needed to go, whatever it was. And part of that is because, you know, my approach to magic, like, you know, I spent 20 years in prison. So I wasn't out here where I had access to things like, you know, orders and lodges and, you know, schools and any of that sort of stuff. Almost everything that I know I had to learn through, trial and error, like figuring out for myself, seeing what worked, what didn't work. Aaron, on the other hand, comes from a background and I should shut up and let him describe this, but <laughs> he comes more from a background of that classical, you know, what we think of as a classical magician. You know, he belongs to several different orders, including the Masons and an alchemical lodge. So he fills in the blanks or the spaces with that classical kind of education in this that I didn't have. So together it's almost like we form a whole person. Cool. And that's what you're doing with shortening or the, taking out the gaps or taking out the obstacles. You kind of complete one another too. Well, Aaron, tell us, I would love to hear more about that. What is your, what has your journey been like? And we will be right back. Easy intuition and meditation, your 30-day roadmap for an empowered life guided from within. It is live now, only $98. This course is delivered as daily meditations, lessons, and prompts over the course of 30 days, and you have a whole year to access. Now, the intention here is to help you to gain that sovereignty in your consciousness, to be deeply in tuned and attuned to your intuition, and to have that show up in your life. So if you have been feeling bewildered or lost or uninspired, the sense of needing to be on your life's mission, well, it all comes down to you and you. And meditation is the portal for this. If you have struggled in the past to have a meditation practice that is self-healing, healing and inspiring, or if you are just ready to upgrade and rekindle a deep romance with the universe through your meditation practice, well, this is designed for that. And if you would like to get in touch with your intuition so it can direct your life, whether for the first time or one of the first times or for the 100th time, again, this is for you. This is extremely high value and very affordable, $98. You have access to the first lesson now and you will get all of the lessons and meditations in a 30-day cycle. If you check out, if you want to go and check out the information page, you have a sample of the lessons, you have a sample of the meditation, so you can really get the idea of this. We have high-quality produced meditations, easy-to-digest education that is attuning and meditative in and of themselves, lessons on divination, lessons on human design, prompts for journaling, self-inquiry and divination, and for a limited time only, we have bonus healing sessions. If you're listening to this now, you definitely want to check when those healing sessions are coming up. Now, I will tell you, they are very soon and these are bonus to it they are group they are powerful to give us a sense of that upgrade and a sense of community and a sense of witnessing under this container of spirit so check it out it's coming up very soon i can't wait to see you there empowered empath this is a program designed for the sensitive soul, for the person with that empathic nature. And by the way, that is a healing ability. However, this is a healing ability that you can't turn off. You cannot turn off your empathic nature because it's more than just a psychic or healing ability. It is also how you are designed. So the Empowered Empath is a powerful program that is also gentle, it consists of four modules with eight life-altering lessons, four aura tuning meditations, and we have bonus group healing and coaching sessions that are coming up really soon. You definitely want to check the show notes so you can see when those are coming up. You have access to it for a whole year. You'll be able to continue to water the garden of your empathic nature. You'll learn how to feel centered and peaceful as a sensitive person, how to use your gifts as a superpower that they are meant to be, and you'll be receiving attunement and healing and new life strategies to live in the power and purpose of your sensitive nature. It's especially tailored for those who want to turn their empathic and sensory overwhelm into intuitive strength. It is immersive, yet very gentle program, and it's suitable for all levels of development. 
and I especially recommend it for those whose human design body graph reveals that they have an undefined emotional solar plexus. So if you are just ready to turn that sensitive sponging into the thing that we really need right now, we need your sensitive genius shining on this planet to be in the high frequency, high functioning of your sensitive superpower. So join Empowered Empath. You have access to the lessons starting right away. Oh, by the way, it's very affordable and even comes with payment plans. Only $177 for all of this content. And you can make a payment plan of three months or six months. I made it extremely affordable and accessible because I know what it's like to need the help so if it's your first time of really healing your empathic nature or you need to do it another time, this is the program for you. I can't wait to see you there. And now back to the show. That's beautiful. And also tell us if you're watching live, Aaron has a little, uh, tell us what the little icon is that, that is serving oh. as your. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's one of the plates from the famous alchemical manuscript, the Slender Solace, mm. which was uh, a Renaissance era alchemical manuscript describing the great work and the creation of the stone of the wise, which is different than the philosopher's stone. But um, yeah, so my background, as Damien already mentioned, was very formal in a sense, I suppose. I actually began my whole spiritual and alchemical journey or magical journey within the context of Eastern traditions uh, when I was a teenager. And I had met a man who very much changed my life and the trajectory of my life. And he was a Theravada Buddhist monk in the Thai forest tradition. He had actually lived in Thailand for many years, but he taught me Vipassana meditation, Shamatha meditation, and really kind of guided me in uh, Buddhism, uh, Orthodox Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism initially, and also in the Nath Sampradaya of Hindu Tantra, which is a medieval um, tantric sect in India. It's relatively obscure, but a lot of people might recognize the Agori Babas, the guys who paint themselves with human ash and live on charnel grounds and mm -hmm. eat out of a skull. It's very death metal, you know, the way they do things. <laughs> not, not really... <laughs> Not really my cup of tea, but, you know, kudos to them. Um, but anyway, I, I met this guy and uh, I was with him for several years. We're still friends to this day and talk all the time. But uh, I was kind of under his tutelage. And he recognized that these practices and these traditions weren't necessarily working for me uh, with regard to my own practice. And I didn't feel I was making any kind of substantial progress. And he told me that, uh, listen, I get it. You still love Jesus. You still love the Western stuff. Uh, read the Corpus Hermeticum, which is mm -hmm. kind of the the Bible, if you will, of the Hermetic tradition. I'd never heard of this. This was when I was about, I think, 19. And so I read it. He sent me a link to a website. Back then, it was very difficult to find a lot of the resources that are widely available today, where you can order books on Amazon and whatnot. This was not the case back then. And uh, I read the Corpus Hermeticum front to back, and I realized, okay, this is what I'm looking for. This speaks to me. This is the tradition I was looking for. And shortly thereafter, I ended up joining the Rosicrucian Order Amor, which is a really wonderful order, but it wasn't for me. It wasn't heavy enough. I was looking for something a little more intense. And eventually, I was led to the order to which I still belong, the Sodalitas Rosicrucius in Stockholm, Sweden, or based in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, that was really where I received not just the education in these things, but rather uh, the transformation that is part and parcel of walking that path. And really, I should explain that that order works with the, within the framework and paradigm of the Golden Dawn tradition, okay. but it's essentially like the Golden Dawn on steroids. <laughs> Whereas the, go the Golden Dawn was very much a theoretical school and there was very little practical work, ritual work or uh, spiritual oh. exercises being done. I didn't Whereas, realize that. Yeah, it was, it was very much a preparation for mm -hmm. the inner order, the second order. The first order wasn't really practically focused. It was focused on giving all of the members a fairly formal education in Western occultism. And then they would use those tools to kind of create their own way of doing magic in the future once they join the second order. But uh, the SRC kind of 
turn that on its head. And really from the outset, when you're initiated as a neophyte, it basically, you're doing very heavy adept level work in one respect. Now, of course, you don't have the understanding of an adept in the second order of the Golden Dawn, or in the case of the SRC, the SSA, the, uh, the second order of our order. But you are meant to begin to do practical work, which will then kind of catalyze the, and engender that alchemical transformation that's meant to occur within the candidate. So it took me 12 years to get from the neophyte grade all the way to the second order, because it's a very, very mm -hmm. intensive process. Whereas the Golden Dawn usually would take a person, the traditional Golden Dawn would take a person five or so years. And uh, I, you know, in, in that, during that process, uh, I also joined several other orders that were recommended to me, uh, a couple of different Martinist orders. <clears throat> I kind of hopped around that because uh, I don't know how, how much most people know about Martinism. It's a relatively obscure form of esoteric Christianity, but it is, if you think there were schisms in the Golden Dawn world, uh, the Martinist world makes it look tame. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of people jump from order to order within the Martinist tradition. But I joined that and I joined uh, the Masons and to, I, I sit on the Supreme Council of a few different orders and to this day. But in truth, a part of the impetus for Magnum Opus <clears throat> was that I personally believe, having belonged to many of these organizations, that this is an outdated mode of spiritual development. And quite often, most orders and organizations within the purview of Western esotericism don't actually emphasize any kind of practical work. Uh, they're little more than social clubs or book clubs that get together and put on a kind of costume and talk about things. Uh, that's not where that's not where transformation comes from. Transformation has to come from praxis and, or practice. And this is really something that was kind of uh, embedded in my consciousness through working in Eastern systems is that there's so much of an emphasis on practical work that uh, when I entered into Western esotericism, I, took, I brought that with me. That was one of the good things about my experience with Eastern religions and traditions. But um, in, the, in the world of Western esotericism and these orders and organizations, that's not often the case. In the case of the SRC, that is certainly the case. All the emphasis is put on practical work, which then brings about and catalyzes that transformation. So really there's a hierarchy of, of the entire process and it would look something like this, where theory is at the bottom. You mm -hmm. have to understand the theory and the symbol system that you're working within to then adequately practice the magic. So it's a uh, ritual magic, theurgy or alchemy or whatever the mode of development is. But really it goes theory, then practice, and the practice informs the process. So theory informs the practice, practice informs the alchemical process of transformation. Mm -hmm. And um, after spending you know, uh, 15 years within all of these organizations, I kind of reached the conclusion, which I still maintain to this day, that these are indeed outdated modes of spiritual development in the 21st century. Most of the stuff that was kept secret and most of this information and these techniques and rituals that were once secret are no longer secret. They're everywhere. Yeah. And we kind of have to reinvent these things for the time or the era in which we, we live. And nowadays with the advent of the internet, we have so much at our fingertips, but it can be very confusing. And this is one thing I hear from a lot of our students all the time, that it's overwhelming because there is <laughs> so much material out there. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. Jamie and I, Although we have uh, different backgrounds with these things, we do have a shared interest in distilling these things into the simplest of explanations so that people can easily understand them and approach them, making them more accessible and more approachable without diluting them in any way. So yes. I think that's a very necessary thing because within the purview of uh, Western occultism and West, the Western mystery tradition especially, I would say arguably more than any other tradition, there is a, an unnecessary amount of obfuscation and obscurity and cryptic language used uh, in, in one term which qualifies another symbolic term which qualifies another symbolic term. And this is ultimately all minutia. So what we really want our students to focus on is the practice, knowing enough theory to supplement the practice and adequately practice these things effectively, 
but really the focus is on the practice and on their spiritual developments and on their magical developments as well. That's amazing. And I have, uh, you know, channeled before that there are, you know, there are no mysteries anymore because everything's available. However, because everything's available, it's sort of burying it in all of the minutia and the overwhelm of the amount of information. You know, literally yeah. there were mystery schools because you couldn't physically find <laughs> the books. Yeah. You couldn't physically yeah. find the people, the teachers. And now you can't swing a dead cat without hitting some portion of it. And so it's hidden again, but it's hidden in, in a different way. In the way it's yeah. revealed. It's so yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And so you two, again, you kind of complete one another. There's one of my favorite channels. He, he channels an entity called Bashar. His name, the person is named Daryl Anka. And he says that, they say that the language of manifestation is physical action. You know, if we just keep loading up our, ourselves with theory, 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 it's, nothing's going to happen, you know, that it right. has to, it, and you'll get, you know, you'll just be looping in it and it, you actually won't experience growth unless you put it and that's, you know, we're here yes. being physical beings. Yes, indeed. Do you think 100%. there are, do you think there are some people who are more, you know, the theory is more of their path and, and then maybe it's just as a teacher or because I do, the reason I ask this is because I teach programs and, you know, some people just want to be in it to absorb the information. Who knows? Maybe that's just where they are in their path. And sometimes just either just in, in, in my, under my charge, don't do the practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I mean, without judgment, I'm just curious. What do you think about that? Do you think that's just maybe someone taking a piece of it and putting it in their life in another way? Or, you know, how, how do you, how do you observe that? You know, just my own personal opinion, um, I would just say I, I really, you know, I don't know. I think <laughs> I, 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 try, I try to the best of my ability where I always come back to on things like that is I, I look at things like that and I may be tempted to judge it sometime or yeah. even to tell someone, you know, that that's really not going to change you, you know, until you <laughs> actually start doing the work. It's yeah. not going to, to change you in any way. And I realize, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they're just, you know, in their stage of development or where they are in right. life or whatever, they're just not ready to be doing it yet. You know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this is at least getting a toe, a toe hold in the door for them, you know, like yeah. getting in through a crack. Um, yeah. But ultimately what I always try to do is, is anytime I find myself thinking about things like that, I always try to just bring myself back to the best of my ability to my practice. And I think, you know, <laughs> if I just focus on what I'm supposed to be doing, then everything else around me will kind of fall into place and take care of itself. And that yeah. person will get what they need out of it. As long as I'm doing what I need, then in some way or another, hopefully they'll get what they need out of it. Even if it's just because, you know, they are intellectually interested in this stuff. You know, people are interested in football and they don't necessarily want to get out there on the field and play it. <laughs> you know, but they still get some enjoyment out of, mm -hmm. I don't know, collecting trading cards or being in a fantasy mm -hmm. football league or reading about players life stories or what have you. you know, at, at least they're getting something out of it. That's, you know, making them enjoy life in some way. Yeah, and I guess. Yeah, that's that's the the point. And yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Damien. Of course, we, we should be tending to our own knitting. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a uh, well i mean that's you know the the law of correspondence as above so below and as within mm -hmm. so without so if i'm noticing something about so and again not not from judgment i'm just that's out of curiosity and yeah. I, I imagine if i sliced parts of my life i in my path i could see that as well where i was really wanting to absorb theory before i was doing practice so i mean stuff like that it used to drive me kind of crazy like i would look at myself and like the miraculous things that i had experienced in my life and in myself because of these practices and then i would be almost you know like one of these people that go from door to door like have you heard about jesus you know it's like <laughs> like you're, you but i was like that with magic i was like look look at this stuff you're not going to believe what this stuff is like what it does to you and it was like i couldn't understand why people didn't just jump on it and you know want to <laughs> automatically start doing it, you know, to experience these miracles in themselves. And then I kind of, it drove me crazy a little bit. And I finally just kind of had to divorce myself of it and, you know, say to each their own and just mm -hmm. focus on what I was doing. Tell us about Magnum Opus, like literally how people, what's, what's the format and how people can, you know, get involved. It, it, it's in the, I'm going to put the link up here again. Um, and so, for those who are listening, the website is 
eventcreate.com slash E slash Magnum Opus Retreat. And it's in the show notes, but go ahead, Damien, tell us about it. So it, it sort of started off as really it sprang to life out of Patreon. You know, I've mm -hmm. been doing Patreon for like six years now and, uh, you know, just covering different aspects of magic, you know, telling people, you know, my own personal experiences with basic rituals, like the lesser banishing of the pentagram or the middle pillar or, you know, angel invocations, things like that, things that I loved and, and was passionate about. And we found that people wanted more. They didn't necessarily want all the old archaic hierarchical structures and all of that sort of stuff that come with like orders and lodges and things like that. But they wanted a sense of community. You know, it, it's yeah. ultimately these practices and the benefits you come from get from them are going to depend on the work that you yourself are willing to put in the amount mm -hmm. of work. But people sometimes still want some sort of fellowship yeah, or, you know, know. and, and it's great. Yeah. If there's like this, this, um, call, I call it spiritual osmosis, you know, then mm -hmm. the resonance one person is experiencing, it's like, it, it, it's when there's a connection of those resonances, it's not just times two, it's time, it's exponential growth and expansion together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So magnum opus kind of came to life from, from that need or that mm -hmm. desire that people had where they wanted some of the fellowship and they wanted access to a lot of the information that would be available in like orders and lodges and things like that, but didn't necessarily want that kind of structure or anything else, which kind of suit us perfectly, you know, especially me because I'm, you know, I'm very adamant about things. Like I have zero desire to have labels like teacher or any of that stuff applied to me at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always tell people I'm a guy you're listening to on the internet <laughs> who wrote some books and is just telling you about his life experiences and hopefully giving you something that's going to, you know, keep you from making a lot of the same mistakes that I did and will save you some time in this process. And that's kind of the way we, we go about Magnum Opus. And we, we have it divided into small groups. The groups uh, we meet once a month and the groups are no more than five to seven people in each group. And we're gradually working through a curriculum of starting with the elements, going through earth and then air and then water and then fire. And then we're going to work with planetary energies after that and zodiacal energies after that. And we pepper little things in through it, uh, like, you know, divination or talking about like, you know, ley lines and sacred spots and, you know, wow. energy, you know, powerful energy locations on earth, things like that, you know, just other stuff that they might find interesting, might want to explore on their own. We throw a little bit of everything out there. Uh, because I think what happens is the more of the stuff people are introduced to, the more chance there is eventually that they're going to find the one thing that's going to light them up and, yeah. and be like, that's my thing, whether it's tarot or whether it's energy work. For me, it was always energy work and angel invocations. Those were the mm -hmm. two things. We want people to be able to find the thing that's going to light them on fire and, and send them down their path. And we always start with, you know, it, whenever we have openings, what we're going to do is we take people all the way through the process. No one can join in the middle because then they would miss the previous material and they would, you know, each step builds on each previous step. So after we take finish this cycle of people we're working with now, then we'll start over from scratch and let new people join and start over. And usually the way we do things like this, whether it's the retreat um, or the classes or whatever it is, we always start with the people on Patreon first, just because, you know, they've been the most loyal and supportive and everything else, like for the six years that I've been on there. So I always want to make sure they get the first crack at anything. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are on there, whenever it's time for new cycles to begin, that's where you'll hear it first. And then if we have spaces left available after that, then we make it uh, available to the general public. But through Patreon is usually the first stop. I see. And so it is all, it's all online. Obviously. Yes. 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 Uh -huh. This will be our first in-person meeting, this retreat that oh. we're doing in October and it's going to be in Sugarloaf, New York. Aaron, would you actually tell them about like the, the Seligman Center and the history of it and all that? Just cause that's really interesting too. Yeah, yeah. So um, I actually live in upstate New York in the Hudson Valley area and uh, the location for the retreat is a place called Sugarloaf, New York, which has a 400 year old history of witchcraft and folk magic and occultism. 
And the actual space that we're using is a property that used to belong to the Swiss surrealist painter, Kurt Seligman, who was a practicing occultist, magician, and alchemist. He actually authored a few books on the, those subjects, but he was also a very famous and um, important surrealist painter and is acknowledged by a lot of art historians as being one of the most important of the early 20th century. So the space that we're using is, has kind of been charged with uh, his own spiritual practice and his own magical workings. And the, the, it's a property with multiple different buildings and the building that we're using, which is kind of a, a studio space, if you will, is the actual space in which he performed all of his rituals and did a lot of his alchemical experiments and as well as his painting. So the grounds in and of themselves are charged with this kind of magical power and energy, but the village itself is also charged with this energy being a place that has kind of been a hotbed of magical activity for about 400 years. Um, it's also an artisan craft village, so it's made up and has been that way since its inception it is essentially a village comprised of people like candle makers, soap makers, artists, uh, leather workers, glass blowers, this kind of thing. It's kind of like a veritable Renaissance fair, but all uh, stationary instead of, you know, moving around the country like rent fairs do. But it's got that same kind of feel to it. Um, it also has several metaphysical shops. So it, it's going to be a beautiful retreat. And we're both very much looking forward to it. Wonderful. Hello. Is it one or two days or sorry, go ahead, Damon. Oh, I was just going to just add in that kind of what we're hoping, you know, like I was describing earlier, like every single time we've ever met in person, it's always led to some sort of transformation yeah. in one or both of our lives. And we're hoping that the same thing happens whenever everybody comes together, that maybe some of that will rub off and it'll inspire them or, you know, give them new paths to explore. Oof. Oof. I'm getting the chills. <laughs> I'm getting the spirit chills. <laughs> That's so awesome. We have a comment here from Salt of Earth says, I've always looked at the Hermetica as the Western version of Advaita, Advaita, am I saying it right? Vendata. Yeah. <laughs> Vendanta. Advaita Vendanta. Vendanta. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah, I almost got it. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Yeah, I, w I would agree because uh, mm -hmm. both philosophies are fundamentally non-dual in mm -hmm. nature. Um, there's... I, I would I would also put, you know, Hermeticism and the Hermetic tradition has a great deal in common with most other esoteric systems of philosophy and practice, whether we're talking about the various branches of Sufism and Islam or Vajrayana Buddhism, better known as, you know, or Tibetan Buddhism, even though Vajrayana is practiced elsewhere as well. Uh, the, these philosophies that all put a great deal of emphasis on practice and a great deal of emphasis on the, the idea of non-dualism in that the subject is the object, the inner is the outer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The mm -hmm. Atman is Brahman, this concept is inherent in Hermetic philosophy. And the whole point of, of the practice of ritual magic or alchemy or even mysticism is ultimately to bring one to the complete awareness of this inherent truth, that the subject and the object are one, that Atman is Brahman, that the indwelling divinity within mankind is indistinguishable from the ultimate divinity, the transcendent divinity. Mm -hmm. And this idea is, is the bedrock of all of these philosophies. So yes, I would completely agree. Yes, and in Kabbalah, which so many religions and traditions draw upon, including um, uh, Hermeticism, that creator and creation are on a spectrum and there's no separation. That's another way that I've thought of it. Or, in uh, you know the holy om, the om, the the primordial tone. There's that's that frequency that that is inseparable from you know object and subject are completely inseparable. That it, the unity consciousness, all of the different ways that we yes. <laughs> explore. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things I've always like tried to explain to people with varying degrees of success is how like in magic and in some of these other traditions, we don't necessarily look at the phrase God created the world the same way they do in religion. You know, in religion, it's almost like when they say that, it's like this dual dualistic way of seeing it. You know, like an artist creates an art piece and at the end of the process, the artist is here and the art piece is there. Mm -hmm. But when we say God created the world in magic, what we mean is more like, like God is this infinite source of consciousness and energy that pours itself into the dimensions of time and space and becomes the world. It mm -hmm. becomes us. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So it's it's at the end of the process, it's not like there's two separate things. It's like the creator is becoming the creation. Mm -hmm. And the creation also is the creator in the sense that we are creators. Yes. You know, the creator gave us a literal copy, which is what I, how yes. I interpret the Torah, Old Testament. God made man in his image. God gave man right. capacity to cr be creator. And that's yes. what magic's about. Absolutely. And I think that's what it means when it says we're made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Like we, we are creators just like the source of creation is creating. 100% yeah. agree. Yeah, I think most, uh, especially evangelical Christianity and a lot of different forms of Christianity, uh, obviously get it wrong when they assume that made in the image and likeness of God means that we literally look like God as physical beings. But if you read Genesis, uh, what I would uh, I would say correctly, uh, if I may be so bold, but if you read Genesis the way that I it was intended to be read, it says very explicitly that after the fall man put on coats of flesh and skin. Now, most people assume that because, you know, in old 1950s biblical movies, Adam and Eve are depicted as wearing literal animal skins, you know, to cover their, mm -hmm. their uh, nude bodies, that this is what it means. But um, it seems quite clear that it's implying that man was a spiritual being and then after the fall became physical. And this is part and parcel to the Western esoteric doctrine of the fall. And the many myths that uh, pervade that tradition with regard to the fall, whether it be the fall of Sophia in Gnosticism, the fall as indicated in the Corpus Hermeticum, the fall in Genesis, the shattering of the vessels in Luriana Kabbalah, all of these myth myths are indicating this idea that something happened, that we were once spiritual and then we became physical. Uh, and I think that this is, uh, this is very important to bear in mind because uh, a lot of, again, a lot of Christian denominations kind of miss the boat on this. Not all of them, but uh, many of them do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and that it's, and we're still not separate. And sometimes it's reinforced it to me through spirit, through my, through guides and stuff that in fact, you know, because spirit creates material. And so yeah. that in fact, this is crystallized spirit. It is a deeply spiritual experience, but somehow it comes with a veil, <laughs> an illusion yes. <laughs> that we are working yeah. through. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. This has been so incredible. Um, I'm, I could talk to you all forever. What are some ways, but you know, obviously we have the retreat and we have um, Patreon and we'll put that all in the description. How would you, either of you help give someone a tip today, how they can start to open up their, their path of magic? Um, obviously Damien's books too. That's what <laughs> Oh, I, I, you know, it's still so strange. I always forget those. Like you people forget will be asking, I do. Yeah. People <laughs> will ask about like, what would you suggest we start reading if we're wanting to get into angel invocation? And I'll start listing off all these people that had an influence on me or that I learned from. And they're like, you remember yours too, right? Right. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. So yes, there are. I, I do have a few books out there that I would appreciate uh, mm -hmm. anyone's interest in. Um, on, you know, the basic rituals of ceremonial magic, as well as things like angel invocation. Uh, but I would also just, you know, that's one of the things I would stress to people is maintaining a balance of studying and practicing. Yeah. You know, like we were talking about earlier, a lot of people kind of tip one way or the other. They either mm -hmm. do all like 95% study and maybe 5% practice. Other people do like myself lean more the other way where you're relying more on practice than on study and you lose some of the theory and philosophy and stuff if you do that, which may, you know, help deepen your practice. So I would just tell people maintain a balance of study and practice and don't necessarily just look at the things that people think are cool. You know, the things that, you know, oh, this is this is intellectual or this is like one of the core books of high magic. I have gotten tremendous, tremendous amount. Uh, of use out of things that people wouldn't necessarily even think of as being linked to, you know, ceremonial magic, like even books on modern Wicca, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. I've gotten tremendous amounts of useful information out of these things that informed and, and led me to deeper understandings of ceremonial magic. So don't, don't be afraid to step outside the box of what's cool mm -hmm. and read things like Silver Ravenwolf. 
you know, that was one of the, the big things that I learned from when I was younger. Yeah, I, I've been in the I've been on a tear of um, books and stories and uh, re uh, accounts of near death experiences or death experiences, which is mm -hmm. for me really finding the the lifting of that veil or the blurring of the lines between spirit and physical. And that's what's been feeding me lately to help mm -hmm. to reinforce that in me. And um, yes. yeah. Yeah, you never know when you're going to come across something like that that's going to, mm -hmm. you know, reignite your excitement. You know, it can, you know, that when you do practice all the time, it can become boring. You know, it can if you're yeah. doing it day after day, hour after hour, month after month, year after year, you can reach a point where you're kind of jaded with it. Mm -hmm. But if you keep exploring like that, you do the joy will come back. You yeah. will find something that reignites your excitement again and it may not be, you know, anything that you've thought of before. Mm -hmm. You know, I was with a client who uh, has started to um, open up a magical practice. And I, I work with this person therapeutically. So we work in hypnosis and, you know, but a part of all of my work is also, you know, when, when spirit and when there's messages and, and I, we got this message for this person to do the LBRP, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram for 33 days mm -hmm. and to kind of work through what might feel like that plateau or that joyless moment because <laughs> yeah, like on day yeah. 11 or 12 or 17, it might be a little bit, it might seem a little rote, but somehow yes. that 33 was going to bring this big expansion. And yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, you know, I compare it a lot to go into the gym. You know, you're not going to walk into the gym one time and walk out looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not. I mean, happen. maybe you won't, but I do. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've done that so many times. Like I've had a really hard workout class and I'm like, am I skinny yet? Because that was <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's like the consistency is is where you see the results at. When mm -hmm. you go on the yeah. days when you don't necessarily feel like going, those are the times when you're going to see the most growth, whether it's in your physical body going to the gym or mm -hmm. whether it's in your spiritual body doing these practices when you might be bored or whatever. That's when you're going to get the most growth out of it. And it's all comes down to I the, I, I talk about this a lot discipline and we must remember that the root word of discipline is disciple to whom or to yes. what are you a disciple and yes. turn that back to that's what discipline is it's not getting a spanking or being grounded yes. <laughs> it's not being punished it is being a disciple to you to your spirit to you know your soul that makes so much sense i've never mm -hmm. heard that before i'm gonna mm -hmm. steal that because hey, that's, that's... I, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't own that. <laughs> that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would only add that uh, if we are doing this retreat and if somebody wants to kind of start with a magical practice of some kind, this might be a great foray yeah. into uh, ritual magic and more importantly, theurgy, mm -hmm. uh, divine yeah. magic, in other words. Because even though I think currently we're sold out, we're about to open up capacity to a few more due to overwhelming demand, but that will likely sell out very quickly for the physical retreat. But we are live streaming the entire retreat online so people can join us and they will receive uh, a link and a recording of the live stream afterwards, but they will also get to partake in all of the lectures, all of the lessons, mm. all the exercises mm. and practices that we'll be doing at this retreat. And the reason I say this is not just to shamelessly plug our retreat, <laughs> but also because working with the guardian angel is something that they can do for the rest of their lives. And when they open themselves up to that communication, the guardian angel will indeed guide them and will guide them to the path, the spiritual path or the practice that best befits that individual person. Mm. So uh, it can be a great way to get started to kind of a lot of people think and assume that the guardian angel must be worked with after, you know, the requisite purification that's meant to occur in the uh, negredo phase of alchemy, to use a symbolic term. In other words, the catharsis phase, the purifying every complex and uh, program within our being so that we can get to the root of our nature. But I, I would disagree. I think that it's something that should be and is meant to be continuously worked with. Even as a novice, you can begin working with it, open up that channel so that you can communicate clearly with it. And it will indeed guide you and give you revelation 
and revelatory experiential knowledge of the divine. So I think it's indispensable. And it's also something that they can use for the rest of their lives, these exercises mm -hmm. and, and lessons that we're going to be giving people at the retreat. Yeah, catalyst and like, uh, you know, a time release capsule. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that you'll yeah, continue exactly. having that delayed uh, reaction, delayed response and, and uh, having all of that resource to draw upon. It's, it's, it's a yes. huge... It's a boon, I think. So, yes. well, I'm really excited about it. And you guys will have to come back on and talk about all of it and maybe report back about how incredible it was. This has been really, I just, I love, I love just talking about it. So thanks guys so much for being on. We have Aaron Osias and Damien Eccles. I'd love thank to have you. you guys on again sometime soon. And uh, yeah, thank you. The Magnum School, oh, excuse me, the Magnum Opus School of Magic and all of the links are in the description. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having us again. It's been great to talk to you and see you. And hopefully we cross paths again in the near future. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much, Trisha. Agreed. Thank you. I just enjoy chatting with magicians like these two are who are passionate and intelligent and also practical and here to be grounded and human and but the path isn't only about it of course it's not we'll just disappoint ourselves if we think the path is only about having some you know really a bypass of the things that are difficult it, it is in the working it is in the being in this experience that brings us those those great experiences and that's what damien said that the great experiences the the big magical transformations that are happening more ostentatiously outside or a byproduct of it but what's beautiful is the continual daily inner transformation and i just love that so much so really very honored to have aaron and damien on i hope you enjoyed it and check out their work and so with that, I want to share with you, as I said, the seven spiritual laws of the Kaibalian. And I actually did a workshop on this not too long ago in the Modern Mystic Life. Um, that is my subscription platform that is very low cost and high, val high value where you get a, a workshop every month and a group meditation every month a live group meditation every month and then all throughout the week two to four times per week you get little uh contemplations little nuggets of exclusive teaching and it's just really awesome and when we get together with the for the workshops and the meditations the community is amazing the fellowship that damien was talking about and so this is from one of those workshops and in fact i'm considering just check in the link uh, to check the description and the show notes here because it's just coming to me right now. So we'll see. I'm thinking of making that class available for you to purchase just to see the replay if you would like. This class that's called Manifestation with the, Spir the Seven Spiritual Laws, a contemplation of the hermetic principles of the Kaibalian. So let's just go through these. The, the Kaibalian, by the way, it's it's a text that's tr attributed to the ancient Hermetic tradition, which is some of what we were talking about in our conversation. And it prevents it presents seven fundamental principles or laws that govern the universe, and the laws they, they provide a framework for the understanding of the workings of the universe, and offer insights into the nature of reality, consciousness, and the interplay of the energies. So. Here are the laws. I will just deliver them to you one after the other just to give you something to contemplate. And if you want to dig deeper, then yeah, check the description and see if I'm offering this class for you to purchase the actual replay of it, which was really powerful, including the engagement with those who attended. So the first one we will talk about here is called the principle of mentalism. All is mind. The universe is mental. This law emphasizes the power of the mind and the idea that everything is composed of and influenced by mental energy. Damien mentioned that one of his favorite parts of his magic practice is harnessing energy. And that's the energy that we're talking about. This mental, this spiritual, emotional, all of it comes in together. Uh, what, you know, mental is just one way to say all of that, that is the energy. It is the essence. And 
there is nothing truly that separates us because all is that energy. The next is the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. As below, so above. As without, so within. This law st suggests that there are harmonious relationships and connections between different levels of existence, from the microcosm to the macrocosm. And, you know, w the ways that we can, we can um, in a healing way, apply this to our lives is to recognize, well, first of all, when you have a resonance with something, someone or something, some event, a positive feeling, that's because it is showing you a quality that is within you. You could only possibly experience that positive feeling, that resonance, if you also had that within you. And then when we experience discordance, something from without that, that we are recognizing that, is, di that is, creates discordance, it's not something that we prefer. So that could be the things that we consider as negative events or negative patterns. That that is actually under the, this principle of correspondence. It doesn't mean that you have the bad thing inside of you. It actually means that there is a, an unhealed aspect inside of you that probably was victim to whatever that is. So I'll give you an example, a practical example. If, something, if some personality trait is something that particularly bothers you or you're seeing that pattern come up in your relationships and you're feeling really, you know, ugh, just that keeps happening and I don't like it. So it's a negative personality trait. It doesn't mean that you are also that as much as it means that there's something within you that wants attention that was probably victimized, that is unhealed, has is carrying a wound because of that kind of personality trait. So if you're really annoyed by narcissism, and maybe you have narcissistic relationships that keep showing up in your life. Well, there is possibly, probably, somehow, and you have to find it yourself, the, the, the flavor of it, <laughs> how subjectively you experience it. The root cause possibly has something to do with being mistreated or victimized by that kind of narcissistic personality or that personality trait. And, you know... This is how things like past life reveal will help because it will be in this life, but it can also, you can have big demonstrations of it from past lives. But anyway, so there you go. The principle of correspondence as above, so below, as below, so above. The principle of vibration. Everything is in motion. Nothing is truly at rest. And this law states that everything in the universe vibrates at its own frequency from the physical to the energetic realms. And this principle of, of vibration helps us to get into the mindset of the truth and reality that there is no separation. As we talked about in the conversation, creator and creation are on a spectrum. Subject and object are one. And so the principle of vibration helps us to be in the frequency of that truth. The principle of polarity. Everything has its opposite. Everything contains both poles. This law teaches that opposites are necessary for existence and that there are varying degrees between opposing forces. So it's like the principle of vibration, which brings that awareness of all is one. And then the principle of polarity adds, well, there are also opposing, there are opposites, which is a kind of paradox to hold these two together. But isn't that exactly what creator and creation ex experienced on a spectrum is all about? It's the, it's the, individual and the unity both being true and that those two things that anytime we have paradox we have the opportunity for expansion just like protons neutrons and electrons inside an atom it is the opportunity for expansion as we hold these um this paradox so everything has its opposite and if we can embrace that if we can be at peace with that then we'll just find a greater sense of peace and i think that's really awesome the principle of rhythm, everything flows, everything has its tides. This law rec recognizes the cyclical nature of life, where everything experiences periods of expansion and contraction, or ebb and flow, seasons, cycles. These are the, the patterns of creation and of flow, and that can, you know, bring us the, 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 um, the presence of this too shall pass.
And to be able to find presence in every single moment that everything is precious, this cycle, this period, this rhythm that is occurring is a part of a greater design. And this moment is just as important as the next or the previous. The principle of cause and effect, every cause has its effect, every effect has its cause. And this law highlights the interconnectedness of all things and the notion that every, every action produces a corresponding reaction. And that's great because then we get to investigate how we can be viscerally and actively components of creation and to be able to understand that there is cause and effect and to hold the higher view of that so that we can harness it and become a part of it. The principle of gender. Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. This law represents the concept that all things possess masculine and feminine energies, not necessarily related to biological gender, and that creation s occurs through the interaction and balance of these energies. So active and passive, to give and to receive, and the, the way that this is flowing back and forth, because sometimes, you know, some of us feel that the, the culture of, I don't know, maybe the hustle culture has been so masculine, so push, 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 so give, 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 so, you know, moving forward when to ease and to lay back and to be in grace and to receive. But this is all a part of it. And the balance and interplay of these energies is how creation actually unfolds. So there you go. Those are the seven laws of the Kybalion. And in case you're interested, the Kybalion is spelled K-Y-B-A-L-I-O-N. And be sure again to like, subscribe, share, and comment when you're on the YouTube channel. Find me on Instagram. Join the newsletter. That's the best way to stay in touch with everything that I have going on. Please find all of those links in the description below. Also find the links to my guests here today, Damian Eccles and Aaron Osias, who are the uh, givers, the teachers, the facilitators. I think, you know, Damian said he doesn't really <laughs> want to call himself a teacher, so humble of him. But they are the facilitators of this Magnum Opus School of Magic. And of course, my programs that are currently going right now, I have Easy Intuition and Meditation. And actually, this is ongoing. You can, you can sign up anytime, but you want to sign up before August because uh, and it's, it's August 8th and August 22nd or 29th. I can't remember. I'm having these free bonus meetings. But you know, if you sign up anytime and get that 30-day roadmap, which you can listen to over and over again for a year, you can also find the next time I'm doing these bonus meetings. We have Empowered Empath to turn your sensitivity into the superpower it is meant to be. Life transformational, the tools that I give here, and also the attunement for um, you know your sensitivity. And I actually have animal communication coming up again, August 20th. So the, all of those links are in the description and uh, just, you know, all of the other things that I would love to connect with you on. So those are my invitations to you. That's the episode I have for you. And I just appreciate you so much for being here. Thanks for tuning in. I love you, whoever you are.